Morning, Tom. Good morning. How are you today? Fabulous. Good, good. Well, thank you for taking part in our interview uh, and our storytelling here. Um, first off, why don't we start with the basics. What year were you born and where were you born? I was born in February 1945, and I was born at 1398 West 2nd Avenue. You were born at that address? Well, I was born at the Mount Carmel Hospital. Hospital, but uh, my dad was in World War II, and he was away in the Pacific, and my mom was living with my, with my grandparents on West 2nd Avenue. Okay. So, Have you lived in Grandview then your whole life? I lived in Grandview until 1985, and then I went to Indianapolis for 15 years, came back. I live in Columbus now. I see. But I lived uh, <clears throat> at 886 McLean from the time I was in a little before kindergarten all the way through graduation. And then I, uh, uh, when I got married, I lived on Ashland, Oakland, and all around. All around the town. And you went to Grandview schools then throughout your uh, schooling? I, I was in the first complete year of the kindergarten being open. They had opened it for the second half for the class of 62. We were the first year to have the whole time. That was maybe the best year of my life. You know, go in there with all these miniature, miniature stuff and everything and played. Uh, first time I was knocked out was on that thing. I, playing tag, I ran into the corner of a thing at the top of my head, so. Uh, <laughs> and then after that, I went Stevenson first uh, through sixth grade, up to junior high, and through high school, graduated in 63. You graduated in 1963. Do you recall how big your graduating class was? 99. And uh, 99 people, and as near as we can figure, about 70 of us went from kindergarten all the way through together. Is that right? We had our 50th reunion in uh, 2013, and out of the surviving 78 members, uh, we had 63 people there. Yeah, that's amazing. So we had a great turnout. Have you kept in touch as much as you can with as many of those uh, yes. graduates? Yeah, we, uh, we have a kind of an email group, and we have about 65 of us on email, so we we can keep track of each other and what's going on. Matter of fact, we're going to have a mutual 70th birthday party on alumni night this year. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Tell me a little bit about uh, the, the high school specifically and how it's maybe different now than it was when you were in high school physically uh, first and then maybe some of the uh, differences you see. The first thing that really kind of shocks me when you walk in, in there is there used to be a giant study hall right above all the the principal's office and and everything and you know everybody had probably two study halls a day mm -hmm. and every and that was just a mass place and it was some people studied some people kind of partied and it was just real enjoyable now they've got it broken up into in into rooms classrooms. and everything so that you know but i went back there just for a play the other day and uh, it's, the way the school has basically held up is absolutely amazing. This this built 1920s, so and it's basically still the same. serviceable. You know, I know that everybody would like to tear tear everything down and make a brand new one, but it's uh, unbelievable how cool that school is. It's a beautiful structure, that's for sure. Yep. It really is. I was, uh, you know, with the kindergarten having the first year there, uh, came up to junior high when they, that was the first year they opened up the gym. Before that, they played all the, all the sports in, or, you know, the basketball and everything in the auditorium. So. On the stage? Not on the stage, but some, pl some places do play on the stage, but right. they, they played uh, down there, but that was the only big open, open area. But uh, I played Mosquito League baseball where the gym was, and there used to be a super basketball courts between uh, where the junior high, the middle school gym is now. Outdoor courts? Outdoor. And people would come from all over. Is that right? You know, East, uh, some of the super players from East that won the state three years in a row would come up there and play. 
it, it was just almost a legendary court that people come up if they wanted a good basketball game. That's wonderful. Did you participate in athletics when you were in high school? I, I did, and I was pretty good until everybody outgrew me. Now, it's hard to say that they out, outgrew me, but I left my junior year. I was five foot tall and weighed a little over 100 pounds. I came back for my senior year just three months later, and I was almost six foot tall and weighed 155 pounds. You'd hit your growth spurt. I hit my growth spurt really kind of late because I was about the most coordinated and fastest kid until everybody started becoming another foot taller than me and, <laughs> and everything. So, But uh, I probably hung around mostly with the athletes because I was... I played all the way from Mosquito League to Little League to Pony League to the All-Star League to that. Played football, basketball. I always say that we had, we had the worst freshman basketball team of all times because... Didn't win many games? I, I was a starting guard at five foot tall and the other guard was shorter than me. <laughs> but they, they, they had opened up wrestling for the first year. So almost all the junior varsity basketball players went up to play, uh, uh, to wrestle. And so they moved all the really good freshman basketball players to play ju junior varsity. We had to recruit two managers to have a team for the freshmen. So we got beat by Grove City 88-2. to two. That was probably not a fun game to that be was a part of. No, I had the two points. So, you know, <laughs> when you're the top scorer, <laughs> that's what you remember. Could be the big dog, even yeah. on a not a great team. Um, were in terms of athletics, was one sport more uh, popular at that time than another? Uh, my the whole class of '63, we were not a very good sports sports team. But the classes of '61, with the Argenbright brothers and and Dan Hughes and everything, they were they were very good, and they were very good at basketball. That was, it. that was their highlight. We had gone to the districts two years in a row, cla the class of 16, class of 61. 62 was all right. Our football team, uh, we, we uh, I think our record was one and eight uh, my senior year. We, beat, we ended up beating Bexley, got annihilated by Upper Arlington. It was just about when they were, everybody had outgrown us. I, I work uh, the elections every year, and I work with a guy from Dublin at graduating from Dublin in 1963. Now they got three high schools now, with about you know 300 in each mm -hmm. senior class. Their graduating class was 44 people, and three of them were from my Cub Scout pack that left in the fourth grade. So did but, so did the Granby uh, compete against those teams? At Dublin that time? was too small. So Grandview didn't, uh, we didn't, uh, uh, Hilliard was the easiest team to play because they were just a small farm, farm town. You know, now they've got three, three giant high schools. But uh, Urbana was in the league, Mount Vernon, uh, Grandview, Arlington, Worthington, Delaware, Hilliard, uh, Whitehall, and Bexley. That was the, that was the CBL. CBL, okay. And, so a lot of traveling around then to and Grandview was held their own in all sports up until about 1962, 63, and then Arlington just had exploded in size. Worthington had exploded in size. Uh, Hilliard was starting to do that and everything. So they were just now we were really the smallest, smallest school. So it was hard to compete, and uh, so. Joe Argenbright, Class of 61. I don't know if you're interviewing him, but you, you should. He's, he's a treasure of Grandview himself. Yeah, right. But uh, he always claims how great his class was sports-wise and everything. But I always tell him that 1967, they won the championship in football, basketball, baseball, cross-country, wrestling, tennis, golf, boys and girls in all those things. That's amazing. Well... We switched from being the smallest school in the CBL to the biggest school in this other league that only had four teams in it. So, but it really, it really gets to him. That, I'm sure that 
they're not that good. <laughs> I'm sure. No. Tell me about some of the other activities you did in high school, um, organizations you might have been part of. Okay. Uh, the main organization was the Brotherhood of Rooks. Uh, the brother, Brotherhood of Rooks, they were officially illegal in 1958. But because of having their own house at 1347 Elmwood, they ran illegal and they really didn't get very many people for the class of 60. Matter of fact, they only end up five because the word came out is if they found out you were a rook, you were kicked off of everything except for school. You could not be in choir, you could not be in any sports, you could not be any anywhere associated with, with the rooks. So five, so they only had five, and then some people from the class 57, 58, they got their brothers recruited as freshmen. And that included three of my best friends, but I didn't get rushed till I was a senior. And so I was, I, I always claim I was the last rush president, the last skunk president. With the, and as a, as a skunk, you basically had to do whatever the actives did, told you to do, whatever they wanted you to eat. You were not allowed to have sex, which was no problem for me. <laughs> you were not allowed to drink, you were not allowed to smoke. And, and uh, I was smoking at the time, so if they caught you with a cigarette, they made you eat whatever was left. Filter and all, it didn't matter, so. <laughs> that it was that pretty, it was, you know, when, when they, you had to be so underground, it really became cruel. Can you tell me a little bit about the history of the Rooks? Yes. Uh, matter of fact, I have something I can send to you about that too, but uh, the Rooks was started in 1914. Uh, there's a cabin in the back of one of the places up on uh, Wyandotte at, at the hill. And that cabin had been moved supposedly from Fifth and Cambridge where, and brought down there and uh, a brother or a younger brother of a guy had started his own fraternity or his own group, but they they limited their membership to only them. So of course it died as soon as they graduated. He formed his own own group and just made rules that they could do whatever they wanted. And uh, they they had the house till about 1919, and the people sold the house, and the new people who bought it wouldn't allow them to have the rook house. So they formed a corporation and they got property donated and they got a whole bunch of fathers and with the corporation and the kids they built the house on th at 1347 Elmwood. Uh, there's a Pentagon window in that in that building and my dad put that in when they replaced the door. That one of my pledges broke down. <laughs> uh, but it was, you know, at that time they had, they had the Brotherhood of the Rooks, they had two uh, sororities, the LAL, and the joke was LAL stand for laugh a lot, and then they had Del Delta Gamma Pi, and uh, they would use the house primarily for parties. The boys ran the whole house. I mean, their dues paid for the utilities and any, any real estate taxes. They did. Uh, two, two rules you, you could live by. You could not have females in the house without a chaperone dance and you, no alcohol. So they couldn't get in any, any major trouble. But they had poker games and they, they had fun. Uh, as a pledge, the, uh, if you were down, like down at, the, at McKinley Field, or uh, down at, uh, the other mayors, <laughs> Pierce. Pierce Field, mm -hmm. yes. When McKinley's drugs were down there, it's hard for me to not say that that was McKinley Field, but Pierce Field, and one of the actors would have you, want you to do something really, really stupid. If you had a friend that was also an active, he would he would give you what was, they called first orders, and he'd say, "Who put up the antlers?" And what you had to do was was get to the rook house from wherever you were as fast as you can, go downstairs, put your fingers in your ear, 
do three jumping jacks yelling Herb Decker, Herb Decker, Herb Decker. That was Why putting Herb up, Decker. Herb Decker put up the antlers that were no longer there. They had <laughs> they had taken down the antlers, but it was just became the tradition, became the first order. It could override anything and everything that was going on. So it was so I had a couple friends that would got me out of some real stupid stuff that was going to go on. So. I've had that rook paddle used on me before. Have you? <laughs> I can't imagine that happening. <laughs> if you were a pledge, you had to have that, Is that once right? or twice. Uh, I don't know. I'm going, but in as pledges, uh, the the actors could uh, at uh, the Wednesday evening meetings, you would get up there and they would try and feed you, you know chicken guts and hot sauce and just anything that they wanted you to throw up. Just And if you did, gave in, you'd have to wear a bucket around your head till it was somebody else's turn to, to do it. And then you got, so you learned not to do it anything. But we had, um, we were in the middle of a meeting with somebody standing up eight, guys or 12 guys standing up there in front of a fire that was raging in August because they wanted to hit your pants leg like that and kind of singe the back of your leg and uh, you know and now every couch in Grandview would go to the Rook House so that you'd have you'd have another 30 guys sitting around on the couches and everything and then we got a ding-dong Avon calling is your mother home? Yes. Come on in. <laughs> she looks around like, what have I gotten myself oh, into? Well, here's my car. <laughs> I'll be right, right back. But the, the, some of the other stuff we would do, we'd take, rearrange those couches at Halloween time and put sheets over them. And kids would come in and crawl around like this. And then the last, they'd get to the ante room and the president would be, in a casket, a homemade casket with candy around it. And so they'd reach in, they'd grab the candy, snatch them, they'd scream, they'd run out of there, and they'd run down to the bottom of steps, and then right back in, do it again. Just keep doing it again. This coffin, we used it, we would take it down to uh, Olentangy and Ackerman, or Olentangy and Doddridge, mm -hmm. and wait till the, at night, and wait till somebody stopped at the light, and then run across from the graveyard with the casket. <laughs> oh, Funny fantastic. practical jokes that right. you couldn't get away with now. You would just, Probably not. you know, there would be cameras and police and everything. Uh, I, did anybody, has anybody talked about painting the windows? To, I don't think so. At Halloween, I think it just was the elementary school. It might have been elementary and middle school. But all the store windows down down on First Avenue, down below the hill, and all the store windows on Grandview Avenue, they would they would paint the paint pictures of Halloween, ghosts and witches and and pumpkins and everything, and they would stay decorated through the through the uh, uh, Halloween dance that they would have on Those Grandview names, Avenue. So the the businesses would do that, or the the students did. The that? students would do that. I see. And the, the businesses allowed them to do it, and then they wash them wash them off, you know. So. And there were some that were, you know, of course, spectacular. And then there were some that you'd get five guys together that, you know, that had a great idea, but by the time it was done, it was just all brown. <laughs> that was mine, usually. I, th I, th I think Grandview has got to be the greatest place to grow up. I've got a friend that I've really, we're email friends, and he's a brother rook, and his name is Bob Nero McNabb. And he was class of 45, the year I was born. And he, he has considered leaving San Diego, that he's been out there since 1950s, 
come back to Grandview to finish out his life. He just, it's just in his mind the greatest place in the world.